So I try to tell people that you need to be in the right mind to start this process. And then if you do start in an informed way, your process, your journey is not going to take three years. It can be much, much, much shorter. Have you ever dreamed of becoming a licensed architect, but feel discouraged by the daunting task of passing the architect registration examination? With a fail rate of 45%, it's no wonder that new candidates often find the exam process lonely and exhausting. But don't give up just yet. Today, we're excited to talk with Elif Byram, founder of ARE Questions, a personalized and common sense approach to studying that can help you pass the ARE and become a licensed architect. Hello and welcome to Architecture Beyond. I'm your host, Brandon Aaron Gibbs, founder of the course platform I Am Studio and director of Studio Motion Form. Architecture Beyond is an exciting new podcast about life after architecture and the stories of those taking their design and creativity gifts to impact the world beyond the studio. This is our first series of episodes, so I hope you enjoy our guests and stories. Be sure to listen to the end for your opportunity of connecting with Architecture Beyond. Just starting um, an interesting series so where we're learning about different architects and the architect for today is Elif Byram of ARE Questions, who's the founder and I just sort of start off uh, asking about where does your story begin? And you can introduce yourself a little bit. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elif Bayram. I live in New York currently, but I'm originally from Turkey. I grew up, uh, born and grew up in Turkey and moved to New York like eight years ago. And I became licensed architect recently, like a couple of years ago, actually. Yeah, very recently. Um, I started arequestions.com in in the summer of 2020 a couple months before covid and oh wait a second i'm sorry couple months after covid <laughs> cut that <laughs> couple months after covid i'm so sorry and um yeah since then it's been a huge part of my life uh on this platform i have practice questions for architectural registration exams and recently i started to add also some video lectures and it a lot of people in the area community thankfully showed a huge interest to my website since its uh, beginning and yeah we are still going strong and uh today meeting with brandon to talk about further like how, how would you define architecture yeah architecture is actually not easy to define but my perspective and my understanding is usually at its core i define it as a discipline where you need to solve a bunch of problems analytically and find the best synthesis of those as a solution to create spaces that is gonna be used by humans and sometimes animals too so that answer to be able to answer those problems you need to have the capability to combine different inputs and data and find a solution to answer everything but it doesn't mean that uh, i know to some architect this sounds like a very dry approach to architecture but that does that this doesn't mean that it has to to overlook the aesthetical or artistical part of architecture. Uh, how I see it is artistical and aesthetical part of the design design practice is also one of those fundamental inputs that I am trying to synthesize every time I approach to a different design problem. And But what we shouldn't also think architecture is just as an art. It has a Building science is a huge part of architecture. So I think at its best, uh, the answer would be the marriage of that two in a, in, a, in a perfect way. And obviously, we are all looking for that perfect, perfect answer every time we design a new, new, new space or building. <laughs> this, this, no, that's, that's good. Like, we're always like, am I an artist? Am I a technician? Am I an engineer? It's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the question, like, it's like, do we, you know, is it my work going in the museum of art or is it going to go to a building board? And, you know, that's the, the, the challenge. What was the genesis that led sort of from where you, you know, your thoughts about architecture to ARE questions or the concept of that? ARE questions 
is not not part of a big um, project or design process, which is very unlike me because everything I have done in my life up until to your questions was all has always been part of a big plan. So I'm I'm a planner by heart, and I guess that's why I picked architecture as a profession because I really like to organize and plan and strategize. So I really liked it, and it really spoke to me. Um, but airy questions is is like kind of a happy accident because what I did was I was in my own uh, zone trying to pass the architecture registration exams. Uh, that was my first time taking a standardized test in this country. So I was trying to learn the system in American education, like trying to understand the American education system and how they verbalize the questions. I passed first four exams myself, but the last two exams I got stuck. So I joined to a community of architects and, and that community actually gave me a, a, a new look, a new perspective. And, and up until that point, I was preparing my own practice material for my own study purposes. Once I opened up that, that materials that I prepared for myself to the, to the community of people, they were amazed by just the sheer effort, I guess, like the work that I put in throughout the years into that material that I only did selfishly for myself. Everybody was, yeah, everybody was shocked that how would someone spend so much hours and create something like this and never show it to anyone. And I was shocked to see the, rea <laughs> the reaction of the community that, that they found it valuable, to be honest with you, because I didn't think that it was valuable. I, I had this tunnel vision of this is just something I do for myself. And once I'm done with my exams, I'm just going to toss this away. And what that, but people told me, showed me the value of what I had. And once I passed my exams, I had to, I gave access to a lot of people actually in the area community for free to, to my questions. But once I passed my exams, I had to shut it down because there was a website I was using at the time to host all those data and I was paying for that and I stopped paying for it. And then people started to send me emails that they are like, oh, my friend told me you had something. Can I please have it too? And people were upset that I shut it down and everybody was like, oh, I, I heard they were really good. Could you please share? And then I kind of felt responsible to this community that I have to share this with the community because I experienced a huge struggle with my last two exams. I should tell everyone here, I think people should hear that, that, that I went through such hardship to pass last two exams uh, so they don't feel alone or uh, it's not just happening to them. So. During that hard times, I was in need of someone to help me, to guide me, to just, you know, just pat my back and say, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Like you are good. It's, it's definitely going to happen. Just be patient. It's that little support is so important that unfortunately at the time wasn't available for me other than my friends that were studying with me. Uh, so I, I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be that person that people can email, people can talk, people can approach without thinking money. And yeah, so I created, I, I, I didn't know where to start in the beginning. So the journey is like this. I passed the exams and the emails kept coming, maybe 30, 40 emails every day. That like It's a, a rain of emails. When I say emails, not just one, two. Every day I was waking up, like my bill, mailbox is like breaking with emails and Everybody, every time saying no is so hard after the third email, I even, if, if people had their phone numbers in their title, I was calling them. I'm like, I am so sorry. I had to shut down the website. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't want to, I don't want to break people's hearts. So I started the website. We had live sessions in the beginning, first eight months, because my questions were super raw. I prepared them for myself. They were not ready to be shared with public. So I sat down and I redraw every drawing in the questions that I copied and pasted from other resources, right? I couldn't do that. So I, all the explanations and feedbacks in the questions, I rewrote all of them and I referred them to a book or as resource so people can go and study further. That was my biggest complaints uh, when I was studying. And then we hold, we held 
weekly live sessions for eight months. During all that COVID lockdown, uh, I was meeting with people every Saturday and we were solving 20 questions every week. With that, we finished like almost 500 questions I went through with the community. So each question is basically vetoed by 60, 70 people that were coming to my meetings every week. And if they had a, yeah, if they had a critique, if they had an opinion, I listened, I revised, we formulated them again. So it's a very organic and long process just for PPD and PDD questions. So that's how it started. This is uh, in person that you're talking about some of these meetings or were these all virtual? Yeah, yeah, all virtual. Yeah, we did all Zoom meetings like every week. Okay, okay, okay. So you originated in Turkey, but you took the U.S. sort of version of licensure. If you could describe that process a little bit, that sort of... Like, in, maybe there's a, is there a link between the two? Here's how it works in the U.S. You have to have a, an accredited de degree in one of the colleges. If you don't, there are other paths for foreign architects like me. But um, the basic is you need to have a degree in architecture. Some states also require a master's degree. So, and even once you finish what your state's requirement of education is, then you start an experience process, uh, which NCARB is the National Council of Architectural Board is calls it as AXP process, experience hours. And you fulfill uh, those experience hours, which takes about, I don't know, a couple of years, depends on the state. Also, some states have extra requirements for experience. And in the end, you start to take your architectural registration exams. There are six exams that uh, if you want to become a licensed architect in the United States, uh, you need to pass those six exams. And at, in the end, you become licensed in your state and you can stamp your own projects, basically. That process, now there's a lot of reciprocity outside of the U.S., which is even a lot of people might be excited about, though it's, it's like, I don't think it's just limited to the U.S. And now it's, you know, with Canada to the U.K., but I think other countries are giving you some credit as well. So, like, I think I Austra know. Australia does that too. Uh, if okay. I'm not wrong, uh, I think Australia is. Turkey and US don't have any agreements like that. I was licensed in Turkey when I came here. But uh, other than the foreign architect path that I applied for, um, it didn't mean, uh, when I first came, it didn't m mean much to the system. But then later on, they adopted this foreign architects, uh, architecture path. And then it meant something. But in the beginning, it didn't mean much that I was licensed in another country. What is, what is that uh, foreign architect path in the U.S. like? If you are licensed in another country as an architect, and if your license is current and up-to-date and uh, uh, valid, you can apply to NCAR and your jurisdiction in your home country sends a document to NCAR indicating that you are licensed. Once NCARP receives that documentation, they also review your uh, education. And depending on your uh, credits that you received from your school, NCARP makes its own evaluations. Uh, but they do their own accreditation. And then based on that, they usually tell people to take a couple of extra credits to um, catch up with the U.S. education. Uh, and then it's, it is a process. Yeah. It takes time. It's paperwork, you know, and then you need to find those classes. It's a little bit of like, uh, work to get those done, but I think it's great because now it's more inclusive, right? Before, if you were a foreign architect uh, moved to this country, the, your chances were much limited. Now you have different paths. And different states have different rules. So depending on the state that you are at, it might be a little easier or harder for you, but at least there is a way. You know, you are not uh, optionless. You have you have some paths you can follow and a guidance from NCARB. And they are very responsive. So I think it's more global now, like you said, and it's better. Like I studied outside of the U U.S., so like cause even me, I was wondering... How much was I for an architect? It's, 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 it, the world is a lot bigger. What were some maybe early challenges you've sort of faced in sort of building every question that it's 
you know, decided to be company and sort of organizing in that way. A financing that was a bit challenging in the beginning because I tried to reach out a couple different people and ask their opinions uh, who are in this business already, like uh, doing something similar to me. And they were very helpful. I should say that everyone that I got in touch with uh, that are right now my competitors, right, technically, have been super friendly and help, helpful and supportive. So I cannot deny their contribution. Uh, that was that was a challenge that I was a little bit scared, to be honest with you, in the beginning, like how they are going to react because I am basically calling you and telling you that I am go going to be your competitor. Would you help me? And um, it's maybe a little unheard of for other businesses, but... <laughs> <laughs> thankfully it's a more friendly environment so <laughs> so they were very helpful and supportive i am still in touch with a few of them actually yeah uh financing it was a little challenging because i didn't know if i was gonna get the investment back right uh, it sounds a little like harsh when you think that way but at the end of the day you are you have to spend money to start a business and no one can guarantee you that if you are going to get your money back. So I cannot thank my husband enough to that he believed in me and we put our savings down for my business. And and uh, I don't think I would regret even if it didn't go well, uh, because it was really fun and crazy experience to do that. Because the first eight months before the website launched was very challenging. I was working my day job and then at nights I was working for the website. So the time was very challenging. Like finding time to do all that was very challenging. But again, motivation was the community. So since I, I, someone later told me that this was an idea already like found and written down by someone. I did not read or heard about this. I, I forgot its name. Uh, but me creating a online study group and inviting people to join my weekly meetings uh, was a very good solution to that to the to the time problem because I was procrastinating. If it was just me, I was just going to sit down and maybe do a few questions every week. But once I promised people that I'm going to bring table like twenty questions on every Saturday. It kept me accountable. So if anybody listening out there is trying to start their small business, you need accountability to produce content. So maybe putting out a schedule, announcing a, 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 a date or like a schedule for your, for your client, potential clients might be a good motivator for you. If you promise people a list of seminars, let's say, uh, in the next three months, uh, you are going to sit down and produce that content and get ready because now it's out there. You, you, you promised and you put your word out. So it keeps you really accountable. So that was, I think, one of the smartest ideas that I came up with. And otherwise, I don't think I would be that productive. So that was a, that was a big challenge. Uh, and I think that was a good solution to that. Uh, of course, it is still an ongoing challenge to make make your product uh, known by people, right? Marketing your product is still an ongoing challenge every day. That's my biggest portion of my day it goes to that marketing effort, basically. Yeah, you have to get the word out because yeah. definitely good ideas. You know, you, you spend time making the idea and the idea spreading is it's a different challenge. But yeah, we're listening to Architecture Beyond, an exciting new podcast about life after architecture and the stories of those taking the gifts to impact the world beyond the studio. Today, we are speaking with Elif Byram, founder of the ARE Questions platform for training architects to pass the ARE exam. She turned her process in passing the architecture registration exam into an opportunity for thousands of others to both start and successfully become architects. This podcast is produced by I Am The Studio, a premium resource for training architecture and design professionals in the top industry software. If you need help with learning design software and techniques to a professional level, please follow the link on our page. Getting licensed. 
a lot of people I know aren't licensed. It's like there's that, that little hurdle. What What is your take on what's stopping people from like saying, let me get my certifications? Um, what would you, your advice be? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge is time and money together. It's very time consuming. It takes 2.7 years on average to pass complete this six exams. So 2.7 years is a lot of time that people, when you look at that data, when you are thinking about these exams and going online and researching a little bit, that's one of the first information you are going to see from NCARB that it takes about 2.7 years. So that is very scary, right? People see that and they think, oh, I don't have that kind of time. I have kids. I have a full-time job. I have a mom that I need to take care of. How am I going to do all of this? Uh, the problem is typically people decide to get licensed later in the life. Uh, once they have a lot of other responsibilities, because earlier years of our careers, we don't think license is that necessary. We are younger, have more energy. We don't have family. We don't have responsibility. Uh, we don't have responsibility at job. Maybe we are on junior level. So it's not as stressful as for the seniors. So you kind of or maybe it's too stressful that you are trying to start a career, you kind of push that license idea to the future. And what happens in the future is you get married, you get kids, uh, your parents need your help, you have a mortgage, you are now senior at your office and have too much responsibility. All that is just that now it's more chaotic, even though it felt like it's gonna get better, it's maybe got worse in a sense. Uh, so that's, yeah, we usually push. So, so then, 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 to, then you see that 2.7 years, you are even more discouraged because it looks so long. It is so long. And the other thing is exams, just exams are just taking an exam is expensive. It's $235 per exam and people end up retaking some of them because you fail and then it ends up being a couple thousand dollars there. And study materials, the books uh, that ANCARP is r suggesting you to read are expensive. On top of that, you need to invest in some third-party materials, extra money, right? So people do this math and they get discouraged. Um, what else I can... I think this, this two, and these two are the biggest issues for many people. Why they put... Uh, why they are not getting licensed earlier is usually because of this too. Well, like what, what's the biggest uh, push for like getting like, cause I think you have like very comprehensive resources that sort of address those. And like yeah. you're, you're trying like a lot better than maybe like some big companies or so like they sort of, so how are you sort of addressing that to make it a little easier? Like with their requests? Cause I, I definitely feel that you're doing, you, you address those. I mean, I thank you so much. I I always try to be honest and upfront with people and tell them that, uh, first of all, I don't think they should spend money on everything, right? That's why I am trying to tell them that they can cut cost a little bit by using secondhand books, making their office to purchase some of the products for them, some of the books, reference materials, uh, asking for help going to eBay and looking for the second end. So when I talk to people, I now also have a YouTube channel. I'm trying to always uh, give this kind of tips to the, to the people to make it less expensive for them. And the time wise, I think uh, that 2.7 years is happening. This is my observation. I don't have the data, but my observation is um, the, the, the duration is that long. Not that people are spending that entire 2.7 years, years on studying, but usually they make a big mistake at the beginning. They take a couple exams without studying or maybe studying a little bit, thinking that maybe they can get away with that much studying, you know? And then when they fail, it really puts them off. And then they take a big break. Like it takes like six months to a year to come back. So here you are, you took your first exam last year, you couldn't pass. 
And then let's say you came back after a year. Now you are more serious. Now you are more, uh, you have a game plan. And then you take, you spend another year, you pass, right? But when you look at the math, it looks like it's two years. But in reality, you only studied prop, like properly only one year. But the data doesn't show that because the, the, the system looks at your first test date and your last test date. And that's the, that's the math, right? So I try to tell people that you need to be in the right mind to start this process. You need to have the right tools, do your homework very diligently before you start. And then if you do start in an informed way with the right resources, your process, your journey is not going to take three years. It can be much, much, much shorter. I don't care. By the way, I should mention, I don't care the duration. And I always tell people that don't focus on the duration. It doesn't matter if you take two years or five years or one year. At the end of the day, once you are licensed, you are licensed. And because why? Because that duration is an extra stress on the test taker's shoulder, which we don't need. They already have enough stress. So they shouldn't also worry about that duration. And if you need to take time off for the holidays that are coming up, feel free, right? Take three weeks off. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, it is going to extend your duration, but you are going to be in a happier um, headspace. You are going to be in a better condition physically and mentally. So if you need that, you should do it. But obviously we all want to be done as fast as we can. So I am, I have been talking to a lot of people who followed my methods and pass their exams in like 11 months, 12 months, 13 months, they get back to me. They email to me. I don't know them. I've never met them. They read my blog posts. They listen my my interviews and they come back to me thinking, they're like, oh, we started this journey super informed. Thank to you. We followed the books, the methods that you suggested. And it was, yes, it was hard, right? It's not easy to read two, three uh, books that each one of them that are like 2000 pages. It's not fun. Let's admit it. But it was less painful once they had a better game plan in the in the in the beginning. So I think my biggest mission and goal is to tell people to know what they are getting into, be well prepared, and once you know what you are getting into, the frustration is going to be less, and the you are going to definitely. Feel finish this process much earlier than the average person because you are going to be well prepared and you know what you are doing. But if you are going to try those shortcuts first, do something else and then come back, that is okay too. My method is not the only working method, but um, these are my observations. I am now, uh, I passed over like 6,000 users and I'm probably... I have exchanged emails over like a couple thousand people at least. Yeah. Yeah. So these are my observations after talking a couple thousand people. So if you follow, you follow. If you don't follow, I, I, yeah, it's okay. Anything works, you know, <laughs> you do you. <laughs> it's, it's beneficial for them to try to shrink it down. But at the same time, yes, it is based on the person because it's like, if it's too much pressure, it's like, you're going to be burnt yeah. out over a longer period. So you need that recovery yes. time. What's, uh, you've definitely demonstrated like some of the great things about every question, try to ask some questions to find a little more about it uh, in this podcast. But is there anything that I guess you'd like to sort of share I, uh, some of the audience for maybe people on the edge or people, are, you know, in the process? I mean, I guess I should tell people that, uh, it is a very personal journey and it totally depends on your background, your experience level, how much time you can put in a day to your studies. But it, it requires a dedication. But if you started this, or if you're cons considering to start this process, it definitely worth the effort. I think that's the future of architecture in this country. Uh, you should... I, I always suggest people to get their license because that's empowering. Uh, I think architecture in this country and probably many places in the world too is 
uh, is a little like working in an office is very demanding and usually we are underpaid and overworked. So I really want architectural workers to have more power in hand uh, to when they are negotiating their fees, when they are negotiating their hours. Uh, if you have a license that gives you the freedom to start your own office or your uh, and other, uh, other, other projects or other businesses that you have in mind, um, you can start those and you can be, you can make more money and have a better work-life balance, hopefully. So I always encourage people to start this process and test and get their licenses. Uh, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to uh, spend time on this. It is a time consuming process and it's not you. If you failed a few times, just that it is, it is very hard. Keep that in mind and don't stop fighting. Come back to it. Take the time to recover, but, but come back to it. Uh, and if you have this goal in mind and if this is your dream, I am happy to support and I think you should follow your dream. Um, be more demanding. There are other people, uh, there are other third party uh, providers out there like me ask for help, ask my help. You can always email to me. You can, e you should email to them too and ask for help. I am sure most of them are very willing and very helpful. Uh, they will help you. They will, they will definitely help you. I will, I will try my best too. My website now also have some video lectures and, uh, I am trying to have produce more video lectures because so far it was uh, questions and I was doing live sessions and during those live sessions I noticed the demand for more visual material uh, architects are visual learners so I'm trying to respond to that to that uh, request and produce uh, all the content for all six exams in a video lecture format uh, it's very cheap right now I am intentionally keeping my products very affordable uh, that's also one thing I think architectural community should demand, uh, should demand the more affordable ARE study materials is what we need. Um, yeah, because we are not making that much money. So it is, it's not reasonable to expect architects to pay so much. That's why I really want to support the architectural workers. I keep it affordable as a personal and kind of political statement that's why my uh, stuff is very affordable <laughs> that's uh where where could they where could they get started i guess point them to the best address so they can visit aerequestions.com it's very literal the exam is called area exams and i named the website aerequestions.com uh you can also google my name it comes up too uh but aerequestions.com i have a blog actually on the menu that everybody misses that if Please go there, read. There are a bunch of helpful blog posts that I, for free, you can read. You can also follow AirQuestions.com on YouTube. I am now sharing some portions of my video lectures there uh, with the community. Uh, again, that's also free. You can watch those videos. I'm sure it's going to help. And you can email me at info at AirQuestions.com if you have any specific questions. I'll do my best to help. Please don't send me the questions that you have seen on the exam. That's <laughs> against the rules. I cannot respond to that. But yeah, um, just let me know if you want to chat. We can schedule some time to chat too. I always do one-on-one -on -one chats. Uh, if I feel like I cannot uh, answer the question properly with an email, I always send a Zoom link and I'm like, let's talk. So we do that too. It's just a one-person show, guys. It's just me. The entire website is me. As there are there are a few people uh, that are helping me per per hourly to run the website, but everything else, all the content, all the like emails and everything are uh, responded by me. So you get personal one on one attention every time you email to me. Thank you, Ulif. Uh, I think you have an incredible product, and I hope more people will get started and uh, just share the message of what ARE Questions is doing. Thank you so much for this interview, uh, Brandon. I really wish, I, I really thank you so much. I know you also succeeded your exams. Uh, so yeah, congratulations again for that. I really want to tell everyone that 
if I did it, if Brandon did it, you can do it too. Just keep at it. Just keep trying. It is very hard. I know, but part of the thing is you don't, you, when you see that fail, fail on the screen, it's not fail. It's another attempt. Don't forget that. As long as you are testing, as long as you're in the game, you still have chance to pass and get licensed. It is going to happen for you too. Just don't give up. Keep studying. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, I appreciate the uh, audience. It's a good podcast to learn more. Uh, there will be uh, also links at the description that you can get involved uh, with the area questions. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next one. It was excellent speaking with Elif Byram and hearing about her growing platform ARE questions where she helps thousands of architects become licensed. It was insightful finding out about how it all began, and the community environment where she inspires test candidates to thrive. You can find ARE questions online at araquestions.com to get started, I recommend that for every architect considering licensure. If you are interested in learning more about the newest design software and techniques, visit our sponsor I am the Studio at iamthestudio.com and sign up with our newsletter this week in design. In the next episode, we'll be exploring part one of a series of 20 popular questions about architecture and its impact in the world. Be sure to check it out. Architecture Beyond is an exciting new podcast about life after architecture and the stories of those taking their gifts to impact the world beyond the studio. This is our first series of episodes, and we're interested in your feedback. Are there some topics you would like to hear, or are you interested in being a guest? Go to IamTheStudio.com and click on Arch Beyond in the menu for more information. This has been Brandon and the Architecture Beyond crew. Catch you in the next episode.